avoiding certain things. I feel like like you have more uh, a stronger opinion and, and you just don't want to say it. I mean, I know you, you stop do. stop reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's tell it where it is. We're I can tell politics. you this. We're talking about money. We're not uh, talking about anything. I can ta- tell you this, that when the dam had was planned in this area, uh, it was uprooting people that had been there uh, well, since the revolution and maybe before, as we were talking about. Now, it actually made some people sick. They had ulcers and had to, actually had to had be treated and I'm sure that you must have felt the same way only there was no spark of hope you couldn't find it we always hoped you know this, that this might take place but apparently you realized that you might be fighting a, a losing battle in a sense I did. I felt like I was fighting a a losing battle and the first thing I did when being assigned to the job was to take it up with the tribal council in the reservation and try to enlighten them as to what was going on. But many of the tribal council were so unconcerned and so uh, uh, dull in history until I ran into problems there, but I did succeed in getting near 500 of the Indians to come over there after I had discovered Ichoda and uncovered the council house, and I got them to come and to meet with the TVA officials. Aubrey Wagoner, the head, was there. And my purpose of getting them to come was to not only view the homeland of their, our ancestors, but to see the work that I had done and to put pressure on the Tennessee Valley authorities to get them to not build the dam. So what we did, I got the TVA officials to come. They put up a big tent and they had catering services for the Indians. It was a glorious day. The Indians came purposely to uh, rededicate old Echota and to build the fire on the original fire hearth in the council house. I have that well covered in photography and I have every speech that was made including my own on tape. I have the speech of Aubrey Wagoner, the head, and I have on that tape his word of where that he will see to it that the Indians will be honored in preserving their, the site of the people, uh, of the, the site of their ancestors okay. at Echota and other places that merited preservation. Immediately after this took place, Aubrey Wagoner resigned his job, making all of his word null and void. And so that's where the political arrangement Mm -hmm. came in. Well, uh, it seems to me that uh, at the University of of Tennessee, and uh, I don't care what nationality you are, you honor and respect another man's uh, find like that. Did you not have the backing of the different uh, organizations of preserving history? And no. Did they not come to your aid? No. Some tried to, but for some reason or the other, were never successful. Uh, the main thing that came to the aid was the Environmental Association when they discovered the snail dart there. And of course, that, was, that delayed it for a while. But... Uh, but it, it's kind of odd that they worry that much about the snail daughter as they would what they were really uh, burying or uh, covering up the, the history that's preserved there. One thing that was my greatest of problems and causing me to have to stay, so to speak, in a neutral corner mm-hmm. was 
I was employed by the University of Tennessee who was in favor of the dam. Oh, I see. Yeah. And the uh, appropriate appropriations for my work was done by the National Park Service and the TVA. They they furnished the money for the work. Mm -hmm. So that put me in a dilemma. Oh, yeah. right. I had to work in a neutral corner to not let the university or the TBA officials know where I stood. Oh, that was painful, wasn't it? Oh, so <laughs> painful. It was something terrible because I had to, on every occasion where there was a meeting, I had to try to show the importance. Well, don't. Mm -hmm. Well, I can understand that, you know, sometimes we think, well, why couldn't uh, the Indians who get, get all fired up, you know, and go over and just do a good battle? But man has to live, and you have to work at your occupation, and you may be heart broken about something going on, but if you have your family, some of the Indian people probably couldn't take off and come and get involved like they really wanted to. So you have to... To keep the home fires going, so to speak, don't you? That's right. Yes. And yeah. in other words, I face problems, mountains of problems that I had to keep silent about, and I had to uh, not expose my feelings in the presence of the University of Tennessee. I couldn't expose my feelings among the tribal council as I really knew them. Neither could I let the Tennessee Valley authorities know that I was there working to get the dam stopped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I couldn't let them know because, well, they cut off the funds. Yeah. Well, I would have got. Well, after you discovered the ruins and everything, and uh, there was so much publicity about it and everything, well, then it looks to me like that. Uh, they could have seen that it was as important as it was and could have stopped it then. Why didn't this come about and why didn't this happen? I mean, what at that point, after you discovered it and there was so much publicity about it, then how did they feel? I mean, the men that had paid you to do this, well, why weren't they backing you and said, why did they want the dam to come in if they would want you to discover this and to dig this ruin up? Identify they. I think that's really important to identify they and you will understand why they did what they did, okay? It is just hard for me to understand. I keep thinking, well now, I'm an archaeologist, the historian, my life is tied up in it. But do other people feel that the way I do? Do those that could have stopped it, do they see the way that I see? Were they looking at merely the, well, we might say progress or the potentials of building another dam? How was it going to benefit? Uh, I, I don't know just how that they, they considered that. I heard many people uh, among the officials come up and say, oh boy, won't this make a beautiful lake? And that's about as far as I could get with a beautiful lake. Well, I see no beauty in destroying the ancient sites of our ancestors to make a beautiful lake. That, oh. Well, that does, I understand that they actually had both, couldn't they? It's a good thing there's just no curse words in Cherokee because I'm not burst forth. <laughs> well, that was more painful for you, being Cherokee, right. than it would have an archaeologist that would have just recognized the value of it. Any archaeologist would have, I'm sure, would have recognized it, the value of the uh, fine. But uh, you had your emotions and your heart and soul in it, too, from your... Uh, background from right. the fact that you were a Cherokee, so it made it uh, painful for you to have to fulfill your mission, as as gratifying as it was to find it, but to know that it, the thing was going to be covered or flooded with water. Sometimes I just didn't think, uh, well, I wanted to use common sense and not let emotions overrule, but sometimes I just couldn't hardly uh, lay down at night and sleep. I, I lived with it. Uh, in shadows of the past, 
my expressions, my feelings is brought to light. And I'm not pulling any punches concerning those that opposed it. And it's going to be uh, it's going to be pitiful in a sense to read when it is published. Because I'm exposing exactly not only my feelings but the crooked dealings mm -hmm. with Tennessee Valley authorities, University of Tennessee, and those that just didn't care. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they goofed, didn't they? Just to <laughs> put it in this way, I mentioned Toqua Mound, where Mrs. William Bean's life was saved. They didn't even give me an opportunity to exhibit that in the proper manner. They went in with bulldozers, flattened it. I hate to tell you that, Ann, but it's true. I believe there's a book of, we have a book in our library about Mrs. Ward. Of the beloved woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a picture of her grave. Have you read the book? It's a paperback book. Wild Rose by, at the Cherokees. Now this is a, a, it's a later public uh, book. It's a paperback published by the Overmountain Press. Just came out about. No, I don't uh, know. Well, uh, sometime when you're there, stop by and go buy it. I think, you know, I, I just think it's very sad that it couldn't have been stopped or rerouted or something to have preserved a, a, a find like that. What could that be uh, compared with, uh, say, in Jerusalem? You know, they, uh, to have found a village like that, there would have been no question about it that it would have been preserved in Egypt or one of the nations. Do you think? I think you're right, and just why that we don't uh, uh, take more interest in the preservation of our own heritage here in America, I just don't know. I just don't know. I don't understand. Well, frankly, I imagine there are many uh, people uh, who, who simply don't understand, but I, I do know when a uh, uh, a project comes along with the enormity of that Calico Dam. Uh, it, it's an enormous job to try to change their plans. Mm -hmm. How long did did uh, what? Uh, now, how long did you work at the, or was an effort being made to change the, the plans? Was there this was, a lengthy one? There was feeble efforts taken. Uh, by one of the Senates, and I forget his name, uh, before the project was even begun. Really? And, but for some reason or the other, he just, uh, um, he just let down on his job. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what happened, I, I'm totally ignorant. And as to why they, they, they didn't follow through in its preservation, it's a mystery to me. That's uh, that's so sad, really. I, I don't know of a word to express. Again, I say that about the one thing good that may have come out of it is that it will cause us to be more thoughtful for any future happening uh, concerning our uh, environment and the like. Mm -hmm. Uh, some good things might have come out that would cause people to stand up and be more bold in opposing uh, projects of that nature when it comes to destroying our natural environment. Well, I hope so. I hope. Uh, but I, I, I have noticed that uh, there seems to be more attention paid to our natural environment, certainly now, than probably, what year was that you were? I had begun in 79, uh, uh, April the 21st of 79, and worked on through until... 69, 69. Uh, yeah, 69. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope that uh, there'd be other corrections to be made like that. <laughs> uh, in 69. And I worked through uh, 76. 
Well, I, I've noticed uh, occasionally you'll find where a dry, uh, a firing range for one of, for the Army or Marines has been rezoned because it was disturbing some animal that was about to be come extinct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they'll change their firing range and have it, you know. So apparently there's more attention being paid to to our uh, environment and maybe to our heritage. I would hope that's the case. I might mention this. My father was given the honor of relighting the fire on the original fire hearth and some of the older Indians tell us that the original fire was kept burning for 84 years and it was a great honor to any Indian person to be assigned the job of keeping the fire going in the council house. Is that right? For 84 years it was kept burning. Well, many uh, nomadic tribes traveled with live embers for that purpose when they reestablished their village there was always the ember from the previous fire that continued it. Mm -hmm. Take punk from a hickory tree and light a spark in the center and you can roll it up and tie a string around it and even dip it in water and it will still keep fire for days. Is that right? I can... Is that how they traveled, how they carried the fire? Right. In a little pouch. From he and wrapped it in hickory. Well, it was a, a decayed surface or decayed material from a hickory oh, tree that would become almost as white as this cup and as flexible as cloth. And when it was dried out, one little spark, you couldn't hardly mash it out. So that's how they would keep a fire going. They could even roll it into a ball, tie a string around it, and of course they tell us that they, you could even dip it in water and let it stay for quite a little while, take it out and the water wouldn't soak through to the fire to put it out. Let me ask you a couple of questions. If the white man and the Indians had gotten along and nothing would have happened through the years, don't you think we'd have had a greater nation than what, what we have now because of your knowledge, your Indian knowledge, and your ways? And I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you think we'd have had a greater nation than what we have now? Let me Stronger answer that nation. question in this way. Someone must pay. There has been a great wrong. And just how glorious the nation would have been if they had have blended together and because there are so much knowledge of the Indian and which the white man could have he could emulate there's so many traits that he could emulate that would have been so helpful to him now what do they do they go back and go to trying to learn some of the old Indian ways because they think that's so much better than what they have now if they had blended those together what would we have it would have been much better. Okay, let me ask you this question. Now that you've lived in Ash County, what was the time you lived here? How do you feel toward us? I think that the people in Ash County uh, fits my way of thinking, my activities, my everyday living, the best of any place I have ever been. I've traveled over California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Wyoming, Oklahoma, parts of Texas, Arizona, into nearly all the states of the Union, but the people in Nash County are more down to earth in sensible uh, Christian fellowship than I've ever found anywhere. The best neighbors I've ever found are here. Kado Usti Ahili, what do you think? Hmm. Well, I love it here. I feel very good here. I feel like there's a, there is definitely a reason that I'm here. I know that. Obviously, for you too. I think so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're honored. <laughs> don't you feel it? I think we're honored to have you. And well, I well, don't. 
and I, I feel yeah. like that perhaps um, um, we just send us more people like you. We can I think for the first time in our life we're getting a chance to hear the, the other side of the story, which helps a whole lot. And you don't get to make that just every day in your life. August 26th, 1980, Ashe County Oral History Project, an interview with John W. Green. Interviewers Clarice Weaver, Annie Brown, and Joanne Woody.